Thank you all for joining us here at the Heritage Foundation this afternoon. As you noticed, we're somewhat back in the 1941 era with our music beforehand. We would ask everyone here in-house if you'll make that last courtesy check that cell phones have been turned off. It will be appreciated. And of course, we welcome internet questions from our internet viewers, simply emailing us at speaker at heritage.org. And we will, of course, post the program within 24 hours on our website for your future reference. Our guest today is Craig Shirley. Craig is president of Shirley and Bannister Public Affairs, a government relations and marketing firm. He has written for the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Washington Times, Conservative Digest, the Weekly Standard, many other publications. He previously authored Reagan's Revolution, the untold story of the campaign that started it all. That was the first book detailing Reagan's pivotal 1976 challenge to President Ford in the Republican primaries. And he also authored Rendezvous with Destiny, Ronald Reagan, and the campaign that changed America for the 1980 campaign, revealing the behind-the-scenes story of that run for the White House. You will note there is a consistency in Craig's books. <laughs> uh, Rendezvous and this are both very well-researched, although this one was over about 15 months, and this one's only about 31 days. You're getting very more detailed than you used to. Uh, we are pleased to have him here with us today. We'll do some questions up here, and then we'll open it up to the audience for anything out there as well. Uh, there were a lot of things different in 1941. There were a lot of things still the same. Uh, the Redskins were being referred to as the Dead Skins, among others. So those of you in the room who are football fans will appreciate that one, of course. And they were doing some other arguments that even we were doing still today. Was capitalism dead, for example, and several of those things. Craig, you talk about leading up to the seventh, and what about the culture of that period of time did you find more interesting or surprising? America was a very uh, inward-looking country uh, on December 6, 1941. Um, that was a Saturday, and um, it, was a, it was quiet in America. Uh, people were... Uh, if they were listening to the radio, they were listening to Fibber McGee and Molly or Bob Hope or uh, Shirley Temple or local programming like here in Washington on Quiz Kids on WRC and things like that. Uh, that night they were going to movies and seeing Meet John Doe and uh, uh, the Maltese Falcon, Citizen Kane, and uh, maybe, a, uh, maybe the movie International Squadron starring an uh, actor by the name of Ronald Reagan. Uh, is that, but America was, was, was looking forward to a somewhat prosperous Christmas for the first time in years. Unemployment had recently dipped to about 10 percent, which is the lowest it had been uh, during the uh, administration of Franklin Roosevelt. They were not thinking about war, not in the context of American men and women getting involved in a war. World War I had left a very bad taste in Americans' mouths. Um, the war to uh, end all wars, the war to make the world safe for democracy had done just the opposite and given rise to very undemocratic institutions in Italy and Germany and other places. Uh, we were walled off, we believe, from uh, war by two giant oceans. Um, and after World War I, there was a saying going around America that the only thing we got was death and debt and George M. Cohen. Uh, uh, so we were distinctly isolationist. We, in fact, neutrality acts had been passed in the 1930s, including one that prohibited American soldiers from leaving North America. That's how, uh, and of course we pay, you know, passed uh, Smoot-Hawley and other restrictive uh, trade acts. So uh, we were very inward looking, very uninterested in getting involved in the European war and weren't even thinking about war in the Pacific. Uh, and that's as of the evening of December 6th. I think you also mentioned on culture, cigarettes were everywhere. <laughs> cigarettes were everybody. Yes, are. that's right. <laughs> Still, following the tradition, they were advertised everywhere. Everywhere. They were consumed Everybody everywhere. smoked. The average American smoked uh, about 2,500 cigarettes a year, and that's the average American. So, uh, And uh, people, people smoked in movies. Uh, when they went to the movies, they smoked in restaurants, they smoked on airplanes, they smoked on trains, uh, they smoked on train platforms, they smoked in libraries. Um, uh, obviously in their own homes, uh, cigarettes were very much a part of the culture and considered to be uh, sophisticated. And you had radio was the major... Absolutely. Radio and, uh, and television at the time, there were, uh, I beg your pardon, newspapers 
there was no television per se. There was a little bit, but not really. Um, although the first uh, television ad had been broadcast in 1941 uh, for Bulova watches, <laughs> uh, but there were almost 2,000 daily newspapers in America in 1941, most of which were afternoon newspapers, not morning newspapers. Um, I, we also noted the culture was somewhat different. I was noting you, you start each chapter with headlines and some other things that right. you've researched. For example, um, airport coffee shop refuses to serve colored quartet yes. out of the Washington Evening Star. Uh, that, of course, they were very conscious of the divisions and yes. segregation. Yes. Did that also not play into the internment that eventually came about, too? Well, I don't know if uh, is that the uh, overlooked in the whole internment issue, John, is the fact that also Italian Americans and German Americans were also interred, were also picked up and interned by the FBI. Uh, eventually, over uh, the accepted figures, about 100,000 uh, Japanese, Italian, and German Americans were interred at some point during World War II. Uh, but there was the uh, there was a great fear in America after December 7th because not only because of the attack, uh, and obviously there was great anger too, because after the attack, then Japan declares war on America, and this really offended America's Americans' sense of fair play. Uh, but the, um, uh, there was, uh, the, the government knew and the Roosevelt White House knew that both the Germans and the Japanese had incredible spy networks operating. Uh, in the United States and in uh, the territory of Hawaii, and, and uh, including this memo right here, was prepared by the Office of Naval Intelligence on December 4th, 26-page memo that we found in the uh, Franklin Roosevelt Library. And I don't think it's ever seen the light of day before, but it goes into great detail about uh, Japanese espionage activities here in Washington, New York, um, at all major military installations, especially naval around the country and in the, um, in the Canal Zone and in the Hawaiian Territory. So where do you fall on that long-standing question? Did Roosevelt really no. know? Yeah, it's, 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 I dug as far as I could on that, John, um, is that in some ways is similar to the time before September 11th and that there were, that there were pieces to the puzzle <laughs> scattered about the government but they had never been assembled, and even so, is that even if they had been assembled, nobody, I don't think, would have come up with the idea that the Japanese were going to attack on, uh, on the Pearl Harbor on December 7th. Straws were in the wind. We knew that. The government knew that. The Navy knew that, knew that and, the, uh, and the Roosevelt White House knew that. The Japanese had become inter increasingly militaristic. They had invaded uh, East China. They had invaded Manchuria. They had quit the League of Nations. They signed the Common Turn Pact with uh, Nazi Germany and, uh, and, and fascist Italy. They signed the Tripartite Pact in September 1941, which formed a, a mutual defense treaty uh, with those two uh, and, and, and thus formed the Axis powers, um, the, the three principal Axis powers. Um, so there had been more and more uh, belligerent behavior on the part of the Empire of Japan. Uh, and so we were watching very closely, obviously not closely enough, but I just want to uh, read from uh, this memo. This is page two, and this is the memo that uh, we just, we uncovered. Uh, it says, the focal point of the Japanese espionage effort is the determination of the total strength of the United States. In anticipation of the possible open conflict with this country, Japan is vigorously utilizing every available agency to secure military, naval, and commercial information, paying particular attention to the West Coast, the Panama Canal, and the territory of Hawaii. So uh, there, were, there were theories, uh, there was speculation. Uh, the Hilo newspaper the week before actually had a headline that said, uh, uh, which is, you know, in the, in the Hawaiian Island chain, that uh, Japanese attack expected this weekend. Um, the uh, uh, other people, other areas of government had speculated about uh, a, a military move by the Japanese, but most thought it was just beyond, the, beyond imagination, and everybody thought that the next military move had, because they'd already invaded French Indochina, they had massed over 100,000 troops there, and their next move was an invasion of Thailand. Because that's most of what Hull was negotiating with the Japanese. Yes, about right. At as of time. as of the morning of uh, it, right as bombs were falling uh, in uh, in uh, uh, Pearl Harbor, 
uh, Secretary of State uh, Cordell Hall was meeting with Japanese envoys. Right. Uh, but the negotiations had broken down at that point. The Japanese had sent the... Uh,